But now is the time, according to research, when nearly half of us, or nearly half of those that make New Year's resolutions would have quit. In fact, research says that only 9% of people that make resolutions at the beginning of the year actually find themselves fulfilling those resolutions. 23% of the people quit by the end of the first week. Am I speaking to anybody? And by the end of January, 43%. Today I want to talk about something that resonates in our spirit and cycles through our minds, and we don't know it, we don't recognize it because we've normalized it. It is what I'll call the why bother syndrome. We begin to say to ourselves, why bother with this? And as big as our aspirations might be, or as big as our goals might be to drink five gallons of water every single day, no matter what the resolution is, whether it is a small baby step, giving yourself a little bit of a chance, or these are big hopes and dreams, there will always be a crisis of faith in the midst of this where you say, why bother with this? And I don't actually believe that it is you saying it, but the voice of the enemy that wants you to say and internalize the statement, why bother? So today, Mark chapter 5, and we're going to address the why bother attitude and then discover why the simple gospel gives us great hope. So let's stand together, and I'm going to read for us two scriptures. We'll stand as we honor God's word together. Mark 5, 21 to 24 two pieces of the same story. And it says this, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him, my little daughter, is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. Let's skip ahead. Starting with verse 35, thank you. While he was still speaking to her, it's another person, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wells of this moment. Place yourself at the scene. Jesus arrives, and there is much commotion and weeping and wailing. Think of, feel the discomfort of it. He went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him. But he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, get up. And the girl who, has 12, who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave him strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told him to give her a snack. Holy Father, thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, use this word. Heal and expose 
attitudes and mindsets that are barriers to you. Lord, help us not to be afraid, just to have faith. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Where does this why bother attitude come from? We can envision the end and oftentimes ignore the road or the journey that's needed to get there. And once we face adversity or the results don't turn out the way that we envisioned or the road is much longer than we anticipated, we become less motivated. We become discouraged. There is a, a wonderful quote in the movie Lincoln where Lincoln is trying to galvanize all of the states to end and eradicate slavery. And he's, he's met with all kinds of resistance. And they know that the, the, the direction that he's, he, he's trying to lead people in will potentially result in a mighty civil war. And so he can see all of the adversity ahead of him. And there's this wonderful quote. I'm going to paraphrase this uh, in my own words. But as he was talking to one of his advisors, he said, no matter where you are on the journey, true north points the same in your compass. And you keep that compass with you to remind you where true north lies. And so whether you have to go and detour around swamps or you're on the peaks, or you're in the valleys, or you're stuck in mud, wherever you have to traverse around, you know where your true north is, and you know ultimately where you are heading, so you don't have to get lost, and you don't have to be filled. It can, Im immerse, it, it, it can, it can emerge in, in a lot of different ways, from our goals for the week, our New Year's resolutions, the diets that we have committed to, it could be all kinds of important life things. I'm not trying to throw that under the bus. But it can also ultimately happen also in our relationship with God. And it's not like we don't want a thriving relationship with God. I think we probably all do. We want to be in shalom peace with God. We want to be reconciled with God. We want to be good with God. But sometimes we're distracted because we just don't feel the same like we did in the past. We don't have those mountaintop experiences. We don't have those high moments like we used to. It feels like work. It feels like we don't have traction. We're spinning our wheels. We're trudging through mud. Why is it so difficult if God is so here, is, is so present and, and near to me? And so we may find ourselves giving up on prayer because it just becomes more of an informational or intellectual exercise rather than inward transformation. We give up on corporate worship because it's not feeding us. How many times have I heard that before? Like it used to. And sometimes it's not even a lack of, of meaning or passion. But sometimes life has just beat us down so much that we're tired and we're defeated. We just don't have the capacity. It's the same as what I hear from so many different people. I, my life is so hard. Right? I, I can't handle new friends. <laughs> I can't handle more relationships. And we treat God the same way. I can't put the effort in with God. It's like too much work. There's a... a uh, 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 a psychologist, uh, counselor, and, and researcher uh, by the name of Brene Brown. Many of you probably know Brene Brown in her work. Tremendous work on the, on the subject of shame. And she has this clip where she talks about marriage. And she said, the whole notion that marriage is 50-50 is a bunch of bull. And she, you know, fill in the blank. She says, sometimes I don't have 50 she said, sometimes I got 25, and, and I need 75 from, from my husband. And so they have this exercise when they come home for the day. They say, how much you got? <laughs> how much you got? And he's like, uh, you know, maybe 60. She's like, I'm a solid 20 right now. 
And then they realize, okay, we're not making 100%. And so now we know that grace has to fill the gap, right? But it's never that equal share of, of 50 and 50. One normally carries the other, not over a long period of time. All right, Siri. <laughs> One normally has to carry the other, and it flip-flops. In this, God is always 100% in love with you. God is always pursuing you with his relentless grace. But God also gave us free will so that we don't have to be programmed robots and instead be in a covenantal relationship. God gave us free will so that we can choose him. Now, sometimes we abuse it. Many times, all the time, we abuse it. (laughs) And we choose our own way. We choose our own will. We choose sin. We choose the way of the enemy. So we do exercise that free will to live contrary to the will and ways of Almighty God. But he still gives us his, that will. He takes that risk so that we can choose him. All of you made a choice to be in this space. I believe, ultimately, not for music or for preaching or for food, although... That's a good incentive (laughs) because we choose him. But the honest truth is sometimes we just don't have that much to give. And we have to pretend sometimes in church circles that we got 100 going on or that we got 75 or that we got 95. You know, I'm blessed. It's all good. Can't complain. And deep down inside... If we're truly honest with ourselves, we got maybe 10 or 15 going on, and we need the grace of the Lord to cover that gap. What does it look like to give ourselves full freedom to come before the Lord and to say, I'm struggling here. I'm saying to myself, why bother? I've had aspirations and hopes and dreams. I want the Lord to be more in my life. I want to be Jesus, to, more, to be at the center of my life more. I want to experience Holy Spirit and have the presence of the Lord with me at all times. But i got to be honest with you. I'm losing hope. I'm straining for this thing. I'm, my, ex, my energy is low. I don't have capacity. And so I am tempted to begin saying, why bother? people that heard the news of hopelessness said, don't bother this teacher anymore. Don't don't bother it anymore. It's over. Now, Jesus is approached by this man named Jairus. Jairus is the epitome of someone who was so desperate that he was willing to take a risk to get to Jesus. He was a synagogue leader. Jesus is still getting his ministry going. We're in Mark chapter 5. But he has gained a reputation. He has gained enough enemies in the midst of his ministry. And they're all the religious leaders. Who is he? He is a religious leader. He is a synagogue leader. He is one of those people that should be, if he's loyal to his own team, will hate Jesus is about to die. He has no other option. He's tried all the prayers. He's done all the sacrifices. He is a keeper of the synagogue. He has been faithful to the Lord in the best way that he knew how. And then he hears about this man named Jesus that colors outside the lines, that doesn't exactly match up to the expectations of Mashiach, the Messiah that was promised to them in that day. But he doesn't know what else to do. He has heard that he has healing power, and he falls at his feet and asks, can you come and lay hands on her? It's his desperation that broke barriers to fall at Jesus' feet. Now, we have all kinds of barriers. When that why bother attitude sets in, we begin to build up barriers. We begin to practice more independence. We begin to say to ourselves, well, I'm just going to have to do it on my own. We begin to build up and even God from coming in. We all have them. But what really hurts me as a pastor, 
What really gets at me as a pastor is that this man's barriers were religious. This man's barriers were the structures and organization of faith that was supposed to be waiting for the Messiah, and there he is right in front of his, their very faces, and they can't accept him. The very barrier, church is the barrier for this guy. Let's just call it what it is. The way he understood the faith, the way he understood what he's supposed to do to be in right relationship with God, that was the barrier for him. And how many times do churches and denominations, and I'm not trying to throw the church, I love the church. <laughs> Please hear me on that. I love the church, you are the church, and I love you. And I love being here, and I love being a pastor. But sometimes church can be the barrier when we create structures in our organization where we can't sit there and say amongst the body, listen, I'm struggling here. And it took the most desperate moment of his daughter approaching death to say, I don't care about that anymore. I don't care about that. I don't care that I don't have the right clothes. I don't care that I don't, you know, have all the right things. I don't care. I just need to get to the healer. Desperation will break barriers and put us at the feet of Jesus. And it's not without a test of faith because Jesus gets delayed. Jesus was so busy healing someone else. Jesus did not approach his home to pray over his... He was so desperate, and he needed God to intervene instantaneously. And he was busy with someone else. And I know we, Pastor Michael and I both have preached about this, but we live in a society of instant gratification, right? We are trained and, and, and cultured in such a way where we don't know how to wait. We don't even know how to, we don't know how to prayerfully wait for things. So there's that, that whole dynamic where we're just not patient enough. Like, we're not willing to wait upon the Lord. Like, we're not willing and, and, and able to just sit in something for a while. But I gotta, I gotta come alongside Jairus in the, in the, in this regard, because it's he, the need for for instant manifestation of God's healing power. It's just that's the way it is. He is desperate for it to happen, and Jesus is delayed, only to find out that he wasn't there that it was too late, and his daughter dies, and the news arrives to the crowd, and they say, why bother? It is very easy for us to be filled with despair. It's so easy for us to be filled with helplessness or hopelessness. It's so easy for us, whether it's not happening in our timeline, maybe it's not happening the way we perceived it, uh, that it was supposed to go, or maybe the very thing that we were afraid of happening, the reason why we came to prayer from the get-go is happening. And we're filled with despair, helplessness, hopelessness. When I was little, I, was pl I played soccer growing up, and I was playing a game, and the coach put me in a position that I had never played before. It was a goalie. You'll appreciate this, Asher. Coach said, hey, I want you to play goalie. I've never played goalie before. And on top of that, we were playing the best team in the league. Why are you going to do that to me? Why are you going put to me, put me in that position? And I like to point the finger of everybody else. 
my defense was terrible. I was a sitting duck out there. I mean, this team, they were, they were a well-oiled machine. I mean, they were just scoring goals left and right. And the first couple times, I was diving. I was trying my best. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was going for it. But you know, after a little, well, there's one guaranteed way for the coach to pull you out of a position. And that is when you just let that hopelessness take over. Why bother? Why, why even try anymore if this is what is going to happen? There's a psalm, uh, in, 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 in a psalm that, that, that sometimes we used to sing about. Some of you recognize it. It says, my eyes look to the hills. Where does my help come from? My eyes look to the hills. Where does my help come from? Now, what's interesting is that in that day, mountaintops had sim a highly symbolic nature to them where that's where the gods lived, right? And so even the people that were faithful to Yahweh God, they were in, in an environment, in a region where people believed in different gods. And so there was this, this is consistent idea um, that on Mount Rydon, he's like, my eyes look to the hills. Where's my help coming from? And in our day, where's my help coming from? And if it's not Yahweh God, because he hasn't answered my prayer because he's been delayed, my temptation is to go to other things, to fill any temptation, to fill any addiction, to fill uh, gratification, to start rolling up my sleeve, and I'm going to create my own opportunities. I'm going to do it for myself. We ignore the fact that we tried to do it for ourselves, and it didn't go so well. My eyes look to the hills. Where does my hope come from? I believe that one of the things that we need to do in accessing hope and not falling into the why bother mentality of despair is to unplug from our uh, unplug our hope from these circumstances expectations and aspirations that are either from us or from the world listen if your hope lies in the nine percent chance that you're going to fulfill a resolution that's not much hope i'm not throwing listen dj keep drinking your water I'm proud of you. Keep making your resolutions. That's okay. But if your hope is in your willpower and your, uh, your man-made ability, you got a 9% chance of making this thing. Are you really willing to put your hope in that? Where does my hope come from? Scan the horizon. Where does my hope come from? I've been looking for that, and I've been looking for this to fill my, that empty void inside. And I believe God is speaking to us to say, don't put it in these circumstances. Don't put it in these expectations. Don't put it in these aspirations. Plug your hope out. Take the plug from, of your hope out from that. Un into the tr one true God. And absorb his hopes and dreams for us. So it's so funny, Quasi that we ran into this problem. So Quasi, <laughs> we run our sound system with an iPad. And sometimes he'll take it home because he's like improving things. He's, he's been a godsend. It's been amazing for, for you to be here and helping us and everything. Yeah. Okay. So he comes to me this morning. He's just like, I, I forgot the charger for this iPad. And it's funny because I have my own analogy of this because I had a charger that wouldn't charge anymore. And I kept trying to plug it in. And I come back like three hours later. I'm like, oh, man, that thing's da still down to 10%. What happened? And I realized that the brick that I was using, you know, that you plug the USB into, it wasn't charging sufficiently. I was plugging my hope to recharge this thing was in the wrong thing. I could leave it in there and turn a blind eye and say, well, maybe it'll turn around. Maybe there's some electrical current in there that will do the job. Or I could say to myself, I'm not connected to the right power source. 
And it seems to me that we need more of a more reliable power source to energize our hope. And so many times we plug it into other things. Self-help practices. Promises to make your life better. I saw something recently. There are so many videos out there of people saying, don't eat this and don't eat that. If you follow all of them, you're not eating. I don't know what, I don't know who's telling me the truth anymore. Listen, I'm going to get real with this thing. We are going to arrive on another political year presidential candidates you're going to be inundated with commercials and advertisements and all of them are going to tell you how this person in that camp is evil and this person in this camp is going to save your life and save our country and people fall for it and say if I just plug into this I'm going to be filled with hope and it may give us a little bit of energy it might give us a little bit of power but I promise you, if we plug our ultimate hope into these things, we're going to look back and be surprised that we're still at 5%. Jesus says, do not fear, only believe. When he finally gets to the house, he says she's only asleep. What was their reaction? They laughed at him. How would they have the audacity to laugh at him? The reason is those people weren't family that were laughing. You see, it was a common practice to help families mourn the loss of someone to hire, would be set for hire to come into the house and wail and moan and carry on and, you know, wear sackcloth and ashes and all of that. And it, would, it was actually, I believe, a healthy thing. It helped create conditions for people to actually grieve. We don't do that in our society today. But I have been in other societies where that is okay to wear a... I, I, I knew someone, I lived in Haiti for three years. I, I, someone that worked in my classroom, I was a teacher. She, her husband died. She wore black, a black dress for three months to give social permission for her to say, I'm a grieving person, please handle with care. We don't do that in our society. So I'm not downplaying all of that, but you see, they were, they were getting some money from this. And so when this knucklehead comes in and says she's only asleep, I believe the laughter was not because it was funny, but because they were offended, because they benefited from this death financially. And so they certainly, Jesus says to the woman, Talitha kum, get up, little girl. Get up. Get up, little girl. And in the same breath, I believe God was saying, listen, you can have hope in me. Hope is not dead. It is alive. Get up and give this girl a snack because hope is alive. Listen, if God has put a vision in your heart, get up because hope is alive. And if it's the wrong hope, God will steer your hopes towards something that reflects his will and ways. If you don't get that job, still get up because hope is alive. If you're battling seasonal depression, get up and face the day because hope is alive. If you're trapped in the throes of addiction, get up because hope is alive. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9 says, By his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope. Not a hope that is dead, but a living hope. Why? Because of me and my willpower and my strength to follow all of God's ways? No, it's through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable. It will not die. It is undefiled. It is unfading, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you rejoice. Even now, even if now for a little while you have to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ 
is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What I said earlier at the beginning of the service is in full alignment with what First Peter give you hope, even if you, even through the various trials that you might be facing in the day. Why? Because our hope is not in our circumstances. It's in the very resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us salvation, that we celebrate here and now, that will one day uh, manifest in glory. Recovery. Listen, some of you are in the midst of recovery, and I'm just so grateful for Pastor Michael's leadership and the fact that we can light the candle as I have been um, helping and now being a part of that team for, for several months now, um, I have seen oftentimes the presence of hopelessness in the midst of the men and women that we're serving in, in our recovery ministry. I can remember talking to a gentleman who felt good about where he was in his recovery journey he would be released because he had no other place to go but to go back to that old neighborhood amongst that old crew, those old neighbors, those old family members. And even though he was feeling good in the moment, was feeling hopeless and helpless because he knew that he didn't have any other place to go and he'd be facing that temptation once again. Hopelessness is pervasive in the recovery journey. I'm grateful for Reggie and, and Pastor Michael and to just to be a part of that team because one of our goals in the curriculum that Pastor Michael wrote called Capture Your Purpose is to instill hope in the men and to encourage them in their recovery journey. There's a lot of pithy sayings in recovery, a lot of fun cute little sayings. One of them uh, is my one that's my favorite. Some of you guys can help me with this. It says, don't quit before the miracle happens. Don't quit before the miracle happens. Re-anchoring into the simple gospel means to plug in to our main source of hope. So very quickly, I'm going to talk about three ways we can plug into hope in addition to unplugging from the power sources that are not giving us hope. The first, Simone modeled for us earlier, it is praise. It is praise. Charles Spurgeon says, I would not speak falsely even for God, but I can testify that the happiest moments I have ever spent have been occupied with the worship of God. There's something about praise that sets our focus not on the circumstances that we're facing, but on God. Either your problems and pain will eclipse the rest of reality to the point where your reality is distorted. You can't even see the light because the darkness has eclipsed it. Or the sun the light can eclipse everything else. And you see everything through the lens of the Father. Being, conditioning yourself and disciplining yourself to be in praise makes sure that God comes first. Jesus modeled the Lord's Prayer to say, to begin with praise. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Glorify yourself. Begin with praise. Pastor Michael has talked about his morning rhythms. Where are you at, Pastor Michael? Is he messing around with the food and everything like that? You say, the first thing I start with in my morning prayer time is praise and worship. If you're not starting your day with against the mind and rewires our perspective and helps us to plug into our real source of hope, praise. The second is authenticity authenticity 
It is the courage to be real and authentic before God and with other people. Scary. I come here in this space on Wednesdays to pray with the staff of Central Detroit Christian. And we had a smaller group. And it's a good thing we did because there was some real godly authenticity that bubbled up. There were people that shared some really... Uh, some struggles and some things that they were facing, things that they normally, on when you're at work, you certainly don't bear your soul at work. But God created a holy moment in that space, and we allowed ourselves to be authentic before the Lord and one another, and freedom came out of that, and Holy Spirit's presence was so evident because we were willing to be authentic. The first man and the first woman, woman Adam and Eve, they sinned. They, they, they did something contrary to what God had instructed them to do. And they suddenly were exposed as a result. They saw their nakedness. They were completely exposed. And their first impulse, because they were filled with shame, was to hide away. We do so much hiding away. do so much hiding away. And I love this space of worship, and I, I like when there's an ordered worship service. But uh, last week, the fourth Sunday, we always do something different. And so last week, we were at a local ministry house, and there were about a, maybe 10 or dozen of us sharing, and, and, and someone shared something very authentic and real. I told him, I'm like, you guys, this is church. This is what church is supposed to be. And how many times do people come into a worship space on Sunday mornings and they're not okay, but they have to pretend that they're okay. And there's no permissive space for them to be real and authentic. When we're released to be authentic before the Lord, it lets the great physician in to bring healing and comfort to us. And we're filled with hope. But if we bottle it all inside, that hopelessness and despair will fester and infect us and distort the way we look at life. I firmly believe that. Finally, praise, authenticity, and remembrance. Thomas Aquinas said, God has no need for our worship. It is we who need to show our gratitude for what we have received. So many times I can, I think lately. But the thing that I love about communion in this, this, this activity of remembrance, it sets my mind back on what Jesus accomplished, the finished work of the cross. I had a conversation recently where, where someone was, was thinking about subject about, you know, withholding certain things from God because it's like we, you know, haven't got all together and God doesn't want a, a transactional relationship with us where we kind of withhold ourselves. He's already done it all. Jesus has already done everything possible to give you full access to him right here in this moment. There's no barrier. Choosing to praise God orients our minds to our abundance when we're reflecting on what Jesus already did and who he is. That allows us to plug into hope. Not to completely ignore and be ignorant of our trials and tribulations and our difficulties, but to fix our eyes completely on who God is and what he has already done. Yes, we might be wrestling with what God has or hasn't done for us lately. Yes, we have these desperate prayer requests, but God is God. He is who he is, and he's already finished the work needed for us to come to him. And so that simple act of remembrance to call back to that singular event where Jesus died a de our death and raised on the third day should give us hope to carry on for the next day. 
to remember. Praise, authenticity, remembrance. Listen, there, there might be others. There might be in different ways and in different intensities. But what I'd like to do now is have a time of Holy Communion where we can practice remembrance together. One important way to practice remembrance is to recite what Jesus did. And so I declare to you today that on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed by his very own friends, he sat down with them. And he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And afterwards, he passed the cup around. He said, this is the blood that I will shed, the cup of salvation. And as often as you eat of the bread and drink of the cup, do this in remembrance of me. And so in our practice, what he has done, and we fix our eyes on it, and, 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 and we don't just appreciate it from a distance. We have bread and a, a tiny little cup full of juice, and we ingest it to give us a new kind of sensory experience to awaken us to the reality that we so often will forget when life is eclipsed by our trials. And it puts Jesus at the center in what he has done. So now life is eclipsed by him. And we see everything through that particular lens. Holy Spirit, sanctify this moment. Let it be holy. That as we remember you, we may be filled with great grace.